Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for for joining me. So today I'm going to do a little bit of a news episode. So I want to talk about three interesting things that I saw on the news. Some of them are healthcare related. Some of them are not. So the three things that I want to talk about today is a Colorado man dies after being bit by his pet. I'm going to touch a little bit upon the exotic animal trade because I thought that was pretty interesting because we always see that the United States has this large, you could say, garden of exotic animals, be that legal or not. I also want to talk about the Medford firefighters being put on blast by their mayor and as well as steward healthcare. What is going on exactly with steward healthcare? Maybe you all have heard about them on the news uh, these last couple of days or even a couple of weeks. So news topic number one is Colorado man dies after getting bit by his pet. So his pet was actually a Gilia, Gila monster, I believe is what it's called, Gilia or, or Gila. It's this giant um, reptile. If you're, you're watching on the video, I'm going to pull that little reptile on the screen, but it's this giant lizard. It's like that Matador lizard, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, it's basically like a giant lizard that if you look at it, its size looks like it could probably eat a human being. But this um, suspected lizard, this, this pet is being put on blast because it can be venomous with, with, a, with a bite. And of course, this man got bit by his, by his lizard. And I'm surprised it's in Colorado because lots of times we hear about these, these crazy animals more in like Texas, Florida, these, these southern states. Like we always hear about the Florida gators or those uh, Texas lions or uh, tigers that people always, always have. Even that, um, that one uh, Tiger King dude, wasn't he in Texas or something? Or Louisiana or somewhere, somewhere in the south. So that, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's pretty wild where you raise an animal, a wild animal. I'm not even sure if these gila monsters are even legal in Colorado or not, but he's a 34 year old male. RIP. I'm not laughing at him or laughing at the situation, but he did, he did, he did pass away after having to be put on, on life support. So this is crazy. Um, he got bit by his own, own pet. It just shows you that these animals, the animals that, you know, are considered exotic or a little bit harder to get their, you could say their instinct is more of an animal instinct than, for example, dogs, like Dogs, you don't really hear about someone getting bit by a dog and then and then dying, right? How often do we hear in the news where somebody got bit by their own dog? You know, maybe they'll nibble on you or whatever, or when you accidentally maybe, you know, step on your tail or whatever, they might they might come at you just for a minute. But you don't hear about typical cats, dogs, fish, birds going after their their owners. It's always like these exotic exotic animals. So this made me kind of dig a little bit deeper into the the whole illegal pet trade and. I got some interesting information I'm going to uh, share with you guys. So in 2020, a survey done by the World Animal Protection Agency, it's a nonprofit foundation, and they their estimates were that about 17.6 million animals are here in the U.S. in 90 million households. So they're saying that about 17 million animals Exotic animals are, you could say, being held or or our pets in the United States, which, which is crazy because that's that's a lot of animals, right? I know I imagine myself having like a maybe Arctic fox when I was younger. That'd be always be be cool to have. But just to give you guys an idea of how much exotic animals there actually is in the U.S., it's 17.6 million of these animals, and 51% of these are reptiles, and 26% are birds. I was surprised by the birds because I'm not a really a big bird guy. I was never big into bird watching, but I do enjoy the occasional time where I do it into maybe a cardinal or a blue jay. I always say, you know, hey, that's a nice bird. It's really red. It's pretty cool. This blue jay is real cool. It's nice. It's nice blue. Or even when you see the great American eagle fly above, you're like, damn, that's a pretty cool bird. But never really thought about owning one myself. But if I was to pick a bird to own, I would probably do like a falcon. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of falconeering, but that was always something super cool where you have like a falcon on your arm and then it's able to stay there and then you could have it retrieve like a smaller bird or some kind of um, rodent and 
and it flies back to you and returns it. That's always cool. I watched a couple of documentaries about falconeering, and I'm pretty sure it was about falconeering. It was about like bird training or something like that. And they actually blindfold the bird and have it focus on its like hearing or perception or whatever the the bird kind of does or whatever senses it uses. I'm pretty sure it's it's hearing because obviously not sight, right? Because it's blindfolded. But they blindfold this bird to have it adapt to finding things or catching things with its other senses, not its vision. So I guess what this does uh, makes the bird's other senses a lot stronger than when it has the blindfold taken off. It's able to use his vision now, but those other senses are so much stronger, you could say, where it allows this falcon or this bird to be able to be a, a better a better hunter. Even it prepares them to hunting at the nighttime because at nighttime it's harder to see. So it just focuses on those senses. And I always thought that was cool. I was like, damn, that would be pretty cool being like a falconer. And when I was in Thailand, um, I'm trying to figure out what kind of bird was it. Well, there was like a person with, I'm not sure it was a falcon, it was a giant bird. And they actually ha- let me hold the, this bird for, for a little bit. Then this thing, like I was looking at its eyes and it was looking back at me. I was a little bit scared. I'm like, damn, this bird right now, you know, first of all, um, like on this mountain, it's, it seems like if this bird starts to freak out, I'm probably going to fall off the mountain. I'm probably going to die. Or this bird could just, with its talons, just tear me up, tear my face apart. And it looked like it was it was thinking, you know. You know when, you, when you look at a bird right in the eyes and you just, you just feel like it's thinking about something, you know, like thinking. Like, you know how you have those those thoughts about maybe like, you know, doing something bad? I feel like that bird was having those those thoughts doing something bad, but it was like, you know, these are just my thoughts. I'm a very mentally healthy bird and I'm not gonna do this to this poor, poor human. And you know, let me let me do my thing. So I was able to hold it and that was pretty cool. And I started freaking out a little bit at the end. So the person took that bird away from me. But I was surprised that twenty six percent of birds in the in the United States or twenty six percent of those seventeen point six million exotic animals are birds because like I said Birds are cool, but they're not the most fascinating things to me besides those those big birds. But so I kind of understand why people might like those, those those birds. So with that in mind, I did a little scholarly Google search of some of the most popular animals that are in this in this illegal pet trade. I think is is it illegal pet trade if you're allowed to have them? So I'm not sure if this is illegal pet trade or just like this exotic pet trade. Pet trade. So um, if I'm making the mistake of, of this, I'm sorry. I also burned my tongue real bad before the episode drinking out some hot coffee. I had to take the cap off. I burned my tongue. So if I sound a little funny, it's because my, my whole tongue is is, is burnt. But, <laughs> but, but yeah. So I did a little list of like interesting animals that they do um, that they do bring in for this exotic animal trade here in in the United States. So the first one was a white lion. And a fun fact about tigers, lions in general, or felines, I guess it would would be called. I'm not sure what the overall overarching term for lions and just big cats is. But fun fact is that there are more tigers here in captivity and as pets than there are seen in the wild worldwide so that's pretty cool most of those are going to be in in texas yeah pretty pretty insane that there's more tigers here in captivity than there is in the wild in the whole entire world more than africa more than india more than bangladesh thailand all those places where i think tigers naturally thrive in um another cool one that, that i found is a dabraza monkey It's a highly intelligent monkey, and they're known for their distinctive white beard. So I'll pull one up on the screen. And those are, those look like wise monkeys. Like, you know how you see a person, let's just say a person of of wisdom, or when you picture a person of wisdom, usually it's it's some dude with like a beard, some long hair. He just looks like old, but looks scholarly and looks intelligent. Well, let me tell you, if I was to own a monkey, I'll probably go for one of these. And I'm pretty sure it could probably teach me how to read a book better than I know how to read a book myself. They look real cool. They have this cool white beard. Um, another cool animal is a savannah cat. It's a cross between a like regular domesticated cat and something called a serval, which is basically a wild cat. So a savannah cat is 
bred by taking a domesticated cat and then taking a wild cat and having them uh, produce an offspring. These cats look super, super cool. I'm allergic to some cats, but I always found cats super, super fascinating, just the way that they interact and just the way that they act and personalities because they're a lot different than a dog. A dog is like always your best friend. They're always wanting to play catch. But cat is like, you know, cat's like, cat thinks they're on like an even playing field. Like, you know, this is not just your house. This is, this is my house. And I'm going to do whatever I want in this house. And you could just do whatever you want in this house too. But, you know, we'll get along. That's how I feel how a cat thinks versus like a dog is like, like, you know, more of like a, a, I don't want to say a partner, but more of like a, a kind of like a more, more, of a servant in a way. It's more serviceful, I guess. Like, it'll play with you whenever you want it to. It's always happy when you come home. It's always like, what are we doing next? Let's go, let's go on a walk, let's do this, do that, do that. First, like a cat's more of like, hey, I'm gonna do my thing, do my, you can do your thing. And then when we come together, we'll kind of figure it out and then we'll kind of move forward in that kind of a playing field. Another cool one is a chimpanzee. That's obviously a classic. Um, if I was not to get that, the brazen monkey, I'll definitely get a chimpanzee. But I feel like chimpanzees get a little big and a little lengthy. So that's I feel like that might be a little bit of, of, of an issue if I was to raise it maybe like in a condo. But I don't know. Chimpanzees are cool. But I, I was always a little more fond of like either gorillas or the smaller monkeys. Chimpanzees, I feel like, are in like in between. I mean, I ain't no animal biologist or whatever. So my limited on monkey knowledge and chimpanzee knowledge is, is limited. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like chimpanzees are kind of like the in-between of like gorillas and like the small monkeys. I'm more of like a... Either go big or go home, get the get the gorilla because if I was to get fucked up by a monkey, I'd rather say, hey, I got messed up by a gorilla versus like a chimpanzee. But it's also cool to have a smaller monkey because those are always like jumping around, always moving, always messing with people, always doing some kind of do always doing some shit. You know, versus like chimpanzees, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, might as well either go big, go home, or get the wild small guys and you have some fun with those bad boys. Um, the last one is a fennec fox. So this is super cool. I actually saw a fennec fox when I was at a dispensary in, in Thailand because as a, as a kid, my favorite animal was like the arctic fox and owls. I always like arctic foxes and owls. I don't know why. I think arctic, fox, ar arctic foxes were always cool because they're they're white. Like how often do you see like a purely white fox? It's almost like seeing a purely white cat. You don't see it too often. At least I haven't seen purely white cats too often. You know what I'm saying? So I always found those to be cool. And there was those cool ears and they're a little bit playful, but a little bit more aggressive, you know? So it's always interesting. So fennec fox is another popular one. It usually lives in a Sahara desert and anywhere where it's kind of um, a desert landscape, lots of times in North Africa. And this guy actually had a fennec fox and he just kept it in a, in a cage and then he let it roam around. And he actually offered to sell me one, not the one that he had, but he he's like, hey, if you want one, let me know and I could help you get one. And I was kind of debating, but then I'm like, hey, how the hell am I going to raise this thing, keep this thing? Because I don't even know how I'm going to get it through Border Patrol, you know? It's not like, you know, not the most easy animal to get across, especially when you buy it at a at, at a different country. I don't even know how transporting a pet works state to state. So I don't even know how big of a headache it's going to be from importing a fennec fox into the United States. I don't even know if Illinois even allows fennec foxes or, or fixes or whatever. So... Decided to pass, but but I do have that guy's contact information, and maybe one day, when I do touch my knowledge and literature level up about the exotic pet market, maybe I will eventually um, get one for myself. Let's sip of coffee here. Hot coffee, hot coffee. I had to top this off because it was so hot. All right, y'all. So next one, next news topic we have here is Medford firefighters deny abusing sick time, call mayor's comments rumors and gossip. So Medford is a city in, in Oregon, and they were actually put on blast by the mayor saying that they are using more sick time than, than they need to. They are trying to work the system of where they call off during the, during the day and call off as sick, but then pick up a shift that night for overtime pay, double pay, just to make some more money. So basically, the, the scheme was that some firefighters were calling sick certain days, so then they could pick up other days where they could take advantage of the overtime 
rate. And the mayor was saying that basically it has cost the city or the budget or whatever $92,000 for, uh, for, for sick time and for overtime pay. But the union leaders saying that they can't explain it and that they're using their contractual rights to use their sick pay. So first of all, I don't know what the fuck the mayor's thinking. If I was the mayor, I would not want to start talking shit about the fire department or getting into their business because, you know, the fire would have happened in your home or your property, you know, and it's going to give you a, a very good look in the community. You know what I'm saying? That's not something that you, that you want to mess with. I wouldn't want to mess with the cops. I wouldn't want to mess with the fire department. I wouldn't want to mess with the healthcare because you never know when you're going to find yourself needing the help from these agencies or these individuals and you might just be grabbing or you might just get the short end of the stick. And $92,000 might seem like a big deal. I'm not sure this was for the whole year or just for an X amount of time, but I took a look at the budget for Medford and their 2023 to 2025 years budget is $480 million. So about like $180 million a year. So now if you look at $92,000 compared to the $180 million budget that they have a year, seems like a drop, drop in a bucket, right? Just give these damn people this overtime or just pay them more, right? They're not, they're not out there not doing their job, right? They're out there just trying to make some more money. And sometimes we finagle the system to get ourselves money because guess what? Firefighters do a great job. Police officers do a great job. Healthcare workers do a great job. Everyone does, does a great job, except the money isn't always there. And sometimes you just have to finag finagle your way. You're not doing it legally because it's in their union contract laws or guidelines. They're, what they're doing technically is not illegal or, or wrong. It's just not the most ideal thing to do, right? But if you're trying to make more money and you're still trying to do your job, and if, there are money, and if the money is there, why not take advantage of it and get it? The budget for the whole year is roughly $180 million. You're telling me that you can give these, firefighter, these firefighters $92,000 more? You could probably fit a little bit more in there, right? How much are you putting into, into other, other things, right? You can't allocate some more funds for, for firefighters, for people that are serving your community. That's kind of a little bit outla outlandish. And he, the mayor, I'm not sure what the mayor's salary is, but it's probably roughly around like anywhere from, I don't know, maybe 60 to 100K a year. That's just a salary, right? Imagine what else he's getting back in kickbacks. Imagine what other, you say, non-financial benefits he's getting just by being the mayor that adds up probably to a whole lot more than a hundred thousand dollars a year and i get you he's not disclosing every single thing how much deals are being done by a handshake a lot you know what i'm saying i've done a couple of handshake deals and it, it, it is what it is both parties are, are satisfied and life moves on so if i was a mayor i probably wouldn't be putting the people on blast maybe i would sit down and talk to them in more of like a close our situation like like hey guys i seen you've been, been doing this it's okay but let's try to maybe not do this anymore or why are you guys doing this do you maybe want to get a couple more dollars an hour maybe you could allocate funding for that and so on and so forth i'm not sure what the whole deal is i don't live in that city i don't even live in the state of oregon so i can't tell you what's happening maybe the fighter fighters are really abusing the system and now the mayor's going public but if i'm a mayor getting into a a little squabble with these community services, community organizations, isn't always the most ideal thing to do, especially if I haven't talked to them personally or like in a in a closed setting. So I found that very, very interesting. All I want to say is if I was a mayor, alderman, our community leaders, our community service men and women out there, I wouldn't want to, you know, be there because yeah, their salaries are paid for by the budget, but they're also probably the leaders in your community. And if you get on their bad side, they have a lot of pull on maybe the next mayoral elections or, or, or things like that. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, the mayor should feel threatened by them or, or things like that. I'm, uh, I'm saying that there has to be a way to kind of 
not bring these things to the news light until you until you have to. All I know is I would want to get into a piss battle with firefighters, nurses, or anybody that's like out there doing doing service. Coffee's good. I like my coffee strong. I actually made some uh, instant coffee today. I'm not sure if you guys are into instant coffee, but I do have a, a French press and I do make some cold brew in the summer times, but I'm a big fan of the French press. It's just uh, sometimes I just like to be quick and on the go and um, instant, instant coffee is always pretty clutch because you just put it in there, put some water on it and it's good. There's no, um, there's no um, coffee grounds to worry about. You don't got to worry about wash a French press and then uh, so on and so forth. Sometimes it's, I prefer this sometimes the instant coffee because if I'm drinking like three or four cups a day, that's a lot. Sometimes you just need a little caffeine, you know what I'm saying? It's a little bit easier because if you put a bunch in a French press, well, guess what? It gets cold, you know? And I don't want to have to remake it in a French press. But now that I'm thinking about this, I could maybe just put a good amount of coffee grounds in a French press, put a little bit of water, use that coffee, and then if I want fresh coffee, I could probably just boil the water again and put it in there. Because usually what I do with the French press is I just put the coffee grounds in and fill it up almost all the way, and then I just sip on there for, for the whole day. But it gets cold, so I guess it will make sense to maybe just add a little bit of warm water each time versus just having a large batch. Yeah, well, see, guys, these breakthroughs I'm having this, on, this, on this podcast, you know. News to you is news to me. News to me is news to you, you know what I'm saying? All right, so... The last thing, the last thing here I want to touch base upon is what is going on with Steward Healthcare. So Steward Healthcare is based out of Dallas, uh, currently operates across Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas. Steward is the largest private tax-paying hospital system in the country with 33 hospitals, more than 25 urgent care centers, and 107 preferred skilled nursing facilities. So the system reports caring for about 2.2 million people a year and providing 12 million people with an encounter each year. So this is a giant issue and this is a not gonna say scandal because not a scandal, but this is a this is pretty groundbreaking stuff because this is one of the largest, if not the largest private tax paying hospital system. Majority of the hospitals you see are nonprofits. A lot of them, a lot of them are either linked to charities or they're linked to um, religious groups and other nonprofit organizations. So lots of times, for majority of you guys that are listening, I guarantee you work for a nonprofit hospital. Um, I work for a nonprofit hospital. It's run by, I believe, like a, like a church or some some entity of the church. So that's usually how things are run. For-profit hospitals are really hard to come across by because they abide by, I don't want to say different quality measures, but they just abide differently than than these um, for-profit ones. And it's really hard for a hospital to be privately owned and functional because there's not a lot of them. I mean, I'm not, not an expert. I don't know what jurisdiction um, is differentiated between private and, and public and and nonprofit, but the fact that there's a lot more nonprofit hospitals, I see that making private hospitals is probably a lot harder than making a a um, a uh, nonprofit hospital. So what is going on here is that Steward Healthcare owns fifty million dollars in unpaid debts. So they're fifty million dollars in, in debt, and they're not sure how they're going to pay for this. Um, and actually, in January, they started talking to people and agencies about restructuring. They're thinking about closing down certain hospitals. And there is some threats. Well, I don't want to say threats, but there is some le- looming potential of them maybe going through bankruptcy. So if you find yourself working at one of these uh, steward health health centers, I'm not saying to quit, but maybe start to figure out, hey, is this one of the hospitals that they might you know, start to close down. I actually worked for a hospital in Oakland on a travel nursing assignment where um, the hospital was getting closed down because the safety building measures um, weren't in line with the 
city or state's requirements because they changed some laws, they changed some, some stuff over the years. And the safety requirements for this, for this building that, that it had to meet, they were not able to meet because they realized that, hey, to meet these requirements, it's going to cost us a lot more money than we have. And it's just not sustainable for them to implement those measures. So they were thinking about either building a new hospital or just closing it, it, it down, which was interesting because that's the first time I ever worked in a hospital that, that's facing that. So I felt like a lot of the resources were, I don't want to say dimin diminishing, but there was a lot less resources there than other hospitals. So I feel like they were slowly kind of closing down. They closed on a couple units uh, right before I started travel nursing there. So slowly it looked like it was going to be shut down. And now that I think about it, it would have been cool to look, uh, look the hospital up because the general consensus when I was asking the management there and the charge nurses and just administrators, people were, were thinking that's most likely going to get closed down. So they get closed down, not hundred percent sure, but, but yeah, but still the healthcare um, is going through some financial troubles. So we'll see. I know, over the last couple of years, uh, Steward Health bought out a lot of hospitals that were going to close down or get bankrupt. So maybe this is one of the reasons why they're kind of struggling financially because they did pick up a lot of hospitals that were struggling financially and they thought that they could maybe potentially have them bounce back and become profitable or at least generate some kind of uh, income or even break even just to kind of keep it, keep it rolling. So it's interesting to see what's going to be happening with, with that in these next couple of months. So stay tuned for that. Um, you know, if you're really inter interested in this, um, you can just look it up on Google and just find some more information. But to my knowledge, that Steward Health Care's annual uh, revenue is $8 billion. So that's a lot of money. Uh, when you think about the $50 million that it owns in debt, might not seem like a lot, but this is a billion in revenue. This is everything, everything that kind of um, comes in. It's not the profit that they're making, you know? So I tried to figure out what their annual profit is, but I couldn't really find much information about the annual profit. So just because you're bringing in a lot of revenue doesn't mean you're profitable and doesn't mean you're going to uh, to be able to uh, ever generate a profit. This is revenue. This is, the, this is just, just, just the transaction of money, the whole grand scale of things because you're you're not sure how much that's going on. We're not sure about more the details. So a billion is a billion is just how much money they're you know transacting, um, things like that. But they could have a billion in revenue, but they have ten million in losses. Technically, they could be net negative. So this is just it's a big chunk. So if this hospital does go under, I would only or if this system does go under, I would only imagine that it would deal a pretty big impact to adjust the whole healthcare sector. I know the healthcare, healthcare sector is trillions and trillions of, of dollars, but just the $8 billion, imagine how much people are going to lose their job. If they have 33 hospitals and let's just say 15 hospitals closed down, that's a lot of nurses, CNAs, physicians, respiratory therapists, housekeeping, diet, dietary, physical therapy, occupational therapists, all the people are losing their jobs. So it might not seem like a big deal on a grand scale of things, but more community-based, it does seem like a pretty, pretty uh, big deal. So this made me think about how do hospitals actually make money? Like where does the money come from? How does a hospital generate money, right? Because as, as nurses, we don't really, really see how the, how the money flows, where it comes from. We have an idea of, of like, okay, yeah, I'm sure insurance, insurance pays and patients pay and then Procedure costs X amount of money, so that gets reimbursed. But I try to uh, dive a little bit deeper to at least like scratch the surface uh, a little bit more. So, how do hospitals make money? A big chunk of their money comes from insurance. But the thing with insurance, as you guys know, there is all tons of different insurance providers and all tons of different plans. So, a hospital doesn't necessarily get an X amount of money per patient. It gets X amount of money per patient based on what kind of insurance that they have. So lots of times they prefer people with with better insurance because lots of times they pay out more. So the hospital does have a insurance 
preference, you could say, and they do have a patient preference when it does come to numbers because certain insurance plans pay out most, so patients, so then the hospitals would prefer to have those patients that pay more coming back or just being their hospital of choice. They want to garner more of those preferred insured patients so they can just make more money off, off insurance. Another thing is more procedures, more pay. So when it comes to procedures, tests, exams, all that kind of stuff, there is two charges that the hospital hospital takes. There's a technical charge and a professional charge. So that's how the hospital gets paid from the government or insurances. They get these, these uh, two payouts, a technical payout and then a professional payout. So the technical payout goes to the hospital. That's the big bulk of the money. And a professional payout, that's the money that the hospital pays to then the physician, the person reading the scan, doing the procedure. That's the payout to the person that, that, that's doing that, the healthcare professional or the group of people that are, that, are, that are doing it. The hospital likes that technical pay a lot because they get a bulk of their money for that. Uh, it's like a fee that the hospital charges for, for a procedure, for whatever the tests are doing or whatever is, is, getting, is getting done. And there has been talks of professionals, healthcare professionals trying to tap into that technical fee, which then becomes an issue because this is one of the biggest biggest revenue generators for the hospital is this technical fee. So that's interesting that, is that how that works, that there's two pals the hospital gets, a professional one and then a technical one, and technical one the hospital keeps, and then it pays the professional one to the professional that's, that's it's doing it. But there has been talks of maybe dipping into technical, which the hospital does not want to do because that's where their bulk of their money comes from. When it comes to the length of stay for patients, shorter is always better because there is certain standards that a hospital has to meet for certain diagnosis that if they don't meet those standards, then if they get a penalty or if they get paid less because they're not meeting these quality measures. So certain diagnosis requ requires that a patient does not stay more than five days in a hospital for this. And if they stay six, seven, that impacts the amount of pay that the hospital is going to get because they're not able to meet these quality measures. So you might be thinking, the longer the patient stays in the hospital, the more work has to be done for them. But that is not always the case because there is standards that the hospital has to uphold. And if they're not meeting those standards, they get penalized. So this makes sure that, hey, hospitals aren't just milking the, the insurance or milking the Medicare, Medicare government or, or whoever is paying out for this for this this care so that's a uh, more of a level and more of a more even playing field um, but what is interesting is that when you have your uninsured people or people that are indigent maybe you know they're here illegally or just uninsured lots of times a hospital takes losses on those so for those people they like to get out as soon as possible. They want to do what they have to and get them out to a facility or get them out somewhere because every every day that they're there, they're taking a bed from somebody that is insured, taking a bed from somebody that is going to pay them more. A little bit shady, but you know, at the end of it, the hospital is, is a business and it does have to make its margin, does have to make its money. And lots of times people that are uninsured or here illegally or homeless or just don't have anything to, to 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 pay from, then those people are unfortunately taking up space for people that that could pay, which does suck. Kind of adds backwards because it's at a hospital, but the hospital has to make some kind of money because otherwise they're not gonna be able to function. What is interesting though is the more complex the patient, the more money the hospital gets. So there is something called a CMI that they use. It's like an index that calculates a number and that number is based on the, the difficulty of treatment and diagnosis and compares it or calculates it with the payout. So this CMI is able to calculate approximately 
how profitable or how much money can we make off this complex case? Those sound kind of kind of crazy, but guys, everything is so algorithm based. Everything is so, is leaning towards more AI. Everything is based on some kind of uh, an equation, even like what we type in on Google is an algorithm, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you guys have heard a bunch about algorithms, but it's interesting to see that hospital has its own algorithm of predicting how much money they can generate off of a patient, which is which is insane. I'm sure it doesn't, doesn't give them 100% a foolproof accurate number, but it gives them some kind of an idea. And the more complex the patient is, the higher the score is, and the more money they're able to get compensated for 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 level of care they have to to provide. So y'all, that about wraps it up. I hope you guys learned a lot about some of the news uh, these these past couple weeks. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, make sure you guys check out the shop. Make sure you guys visit the YouTube channel. Make sure you guys subscribe, like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, there's also a bunch of good resources for nurses, nursing students, travel nurses out there on the couplenurses.com website. We also got a shop. Make sure to, to stop in. I'm going to try and do more of these news segments just because they're pretty interesting. Like, you know, you kind of just spitball ideas and you just have like a, a little bit of a, of a conversation uh, with myself about, about these things. And it's interesting to kind of look at the news, even though I try to stay away from the news as much as possible because I feel like a lot of it's a little bit toxic. A lot of it's, um, you could say, likes to message your emotions. But it's always cool to see what's going on in, in the world, what's going on in the, the U.S. And I always like bullshitting about these little, little, little things here and there. So, guys, I hope you have an amazing week or amazing weekend. Hope you have a great time at work. And uh, don't forget to go outside, spend some time in nature, and do some things outside of your comfort level. Have a good one, guys. See you next time. Oh, I got to go. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my.